this week, I'm going to focus on doing some demos, actually. So I'm not going to be doing any of the um, slides or any of that stuff, but um, I'll dive into a handful of tools um, to demonstrate some of the um, some of the points that we talked about last week. Um, so uh, because we've been using um, because uh, we've been using PDFs for a little while, um, I'm going to stick with that file format. I found a really good one that provides a good example for uh, malware analysis that we'll uh, that we'll go ahead and use for this lecture. Um, so a little bit of background. Um, I'm going to actually bring up the web browser. <coughs> this really useful site that someone put together um, that can be a little bit difficult to read because of the color scheme chosen. Um, but I'll make sure that I get a link to this one on my site. I've also got a number of other links on the class webpage um, right here. So if I show you. So underneath here I've got some recommended resources. Um, there's actually a lot of uh, really good ones that have been put on here. Let me see. Um, I think this one. I can't remember if it's on here or not, but uh, she actually put together a really good. these things um she actually put together a really good um i don't know if you call it a course but a curriculum for a conference that she's currently at right now um so <clears throat> uh, this one's a really good site to follow uh, additionally um this one the contagio site this one has a lot of uh, really interesting analysis of um, in some cases it ends up being kind of newsworthy thing so it's the uh, this person Mila she um, <clears throat> has a large number of uh, um, will do some commentary on stuff that's security in the news but then also will um, do some analysis of uh, malware that's been found in the wild and stuff like that so here's an example of one uh, right here so, uh, so that's another site that can have some really good insight as to maybe what you would do or what would be good steps from an analysis perspective. Um, so <clears throat> this one, another one that has um, kind of a number of tutorials and walkthroughs of various tools. So I, w I, I haven't gone through all these, but um, I have followed a lot of these you know for quite some time so I'm actually going to just use a handful of tools that I've picked out um, some that I'm more familiar with some that I'm less familiar with um, and then we can kind of play with uh, with the data afterwards to see what we can find so uh, that said um, <clears throat> what I've done is I actually installed right here one of those excuse me, one of those uh, Windows XP images from that site that I kind of gave everyone during the first weeks of class. And um, <clears throat> what I ended up doing, and I'll go into the settings just to kind of talk through this a little bit, is after I, can, after I set up the machine, um, I actually used the settings, uh, the default machine settings that came uh, built into the OVA file uh, by Microsoft. So I didn't change them much. Um, except when I was setting this up initially, <clears throat> I went into the network section and I messed with the adapter one to set it to NAT um, so that it would be able to communicate with the internet. Uh, so, uh, so for Windows and for a lot of the installation of tools, 
Uh, you would like to download those to your Windows VM uh, from the internet so you can install them. Some of them uh, actually install, or I should say need to go on the internet and fetch other things like Python or Perl or anything like that. So what I always do is I'll have the VM started in NAT mode basically, or network address translation mode, uh, which basically gives it a, a uh, transparent connection to the internet. So it makes all of the requests that your VM is doing, it makes it look like your laptop is doing it. <clears throat> so once I've got everything installed on the system, then what I end up doing is I switch it over to this host only adapter mode. Um, and you actually get to choose. Um, there's a separate section in here and I think I talked about it during week uh, two, uh, but you get to choose uh, what name you want to give it. Um, that tells you in your uh, settings, so you don't see it here because I haven't run a VM since I booted the machine, but that tells you in your Linux settings uh, which adapter you want to connect it to. Might actually be able to do this and see it. Yeah, there we go. What's up? Oh, my apologies. So I ran if config a. Shows me all the adapters that are configured on here, both the physical ones and the virtual ones. Um, and basically, um, you can have multiple different virtual uh, virtual box uh, virtualized network adapters. Uh, what this ends up simulating is while the other mode, the NAT mode, um, basically allows the VM to act like it's coming directly from your network card, this one actually sets up a fake network card uh, inside of a virtual box and then both your VM and your um, laptop, your host, uh, basically get a virtual network adapter and each one of them can change the virtual network adapter uh, settings um, independently of one another and um, the virtual box actually simulates the wire between the two. Uh, so I set it to that because when I'm analyzing malware I don't just want to keep the uh, VM from connecting to the internet and possibly you know, um, arousing suspicion or possibly, you know, breaking any rules. Um, for instance, you know, the university probably has some rules about intentionally running malware on their network and stuff like that. You don't want to break. So you want to make sure that it's safely contained. You don't always know what a piece of malware does, so you also don't want it to accidentally uh, try and interact with other machines that happen to be on the same local network. Um, so the reason I don't pick one of these other options like internal network or something like that is that when I'm running it I would actually like to be able to interact with it. So I would like to be able to capture the data, route the data, stuff like that within my own computer. So that said, basically kind of what my, what my sequence of steps is, is I install the software on here that I'm going to use. So I copy everything that I need to download from the internet. Then I shut down the machine. Then I switch that network adapter over to um, uh, over to host only mode. And then it stays like that for the duration of time that I'm going to be analyzing everything. Um, another thing I do uh, is I make use of the snapshots. So uh, what you can see here is that I set it up at some point. So I just redid this whole thing uh, not too long ago. Um, so I set it up and then I um, took um, Acrobat 8, so Acrobat Reader 8, and I actually installed that on there and I took Snapshot. Um, so the goal with this is that, uh, for instance, if I go and run it, like this. And say, you know, maybe I just decide to like delete this or something. Then I can power off the machine, restore the snapshot, and then when I start it up again, it's back the way I left it. It's back the way I saved it. 
it's off the screen. There. So I deleted this folder, and then I um, and then I uh, restored from the snapshot. So. <coughs> So um, what I've done is in addition to installing a number of tools, um, and this is just an example, it's not required to follow this kind of protocol. Um, typically when I have a piece of malware, I don't know exactly what um, software, like what software version it's going to, uh, it's going to try and target. So for Acrobat Reader, um, you can actually find these on the internet with some digging. So I didn't want to find them all on the internet. Uh, so I, I'm actually going to delete these things too. So these are some just files left over from one of the previous classes. Um, <coughs> but um, you know I have Acrobat Reader 8, 8.1, 8.2, 9.3, 9.4, 9.3, 9.5, 9.6, 9.7, 9.8, 9.9, 9.10, 9.11, 9.12, 9.13, 9.14, 9.15, 9.16, 9.17, 9.18, 9.
cetera. So another tool that's actually really useful, and I'm going to go here. There's actually two tools. I'm only going to deal with one of them uh, for this class, um, but there's actually two tools. The first one that comes up is called FakeNet, which um, <clears throat> what it allows you to do is it'll be a program that runs on a machine, and if you um, it'll listen on a whole bunch of ports on that machine, basically pretend to be a lot of really common services. The goal is that if uh, your malware tries to use a, no, any one of a number of very well-known services like H HTTP, um, FTP, um, SMTP, um, you know, SSL encapsulated uh, communication, that type of stuff, um, FakeNet will actually run and save a log of the traffic and all the different requests that are attempted to be, uh, to be made against it. So, uh, so it's really helpful. Uh, FakeNet uh, is designed to run in Windows. So either you run it on your Windows host or you can run it inside of another Windows VM. They generally recommend uh, running any one of these things inside of a VM or perhaps running it just on a separate machine. Um, <clears throat> and then iNetSim is a, a similar idea, uh, but it happens to be more Unix centric. So uh, it runs on the Unix machine. This is actually the one that we will use. Um, and it tries to simulate a large uh, a large array of uh, different um, network protocols and everything. So, so we have a way to capture data if, uh, if malware happens to communicate out. Um, we also have a way to simulate data. And so what I'm going to do I've actually created a um, uh, iNetSim user. So basically, um, what I do, you know, basically I did this. In a nutshell, I did this, and um, I did that because uh, iNetSim is hard-coded to run as an unprivileged user. That way, if someone were ever to find a vulnerability in iNetSim or something like that, um, any potential damage from escape uh, would be minimized. Because you, I, you know, I will say that what you're attempting to do here is, at least on a network level, allowing malware network packets to escape quotes the VM and interact with a program that happens to be running on your computer. So, <coughs> um, so as a precaution, uh, they ended up doing, you know, they ended up uh, hard coding this unprivileged user in there. So I'm going to do the same thing. Uh, and then what I ended up doing was I copied all the files from the INAT sim bundle. So, um, if I go here um, and look at my dynamic tools, I've got a large folder of all the dynamic tools. Uh, I actually extracted the contents of iNetSim right here. Um, and then I just basically copied them all. You know, like that basically. Sudo cp. So, so I'm in iNetSim, and I'm going to open up the configuration file for it just to kind of give you a look at what it has. And that's pretty readable, so I'll leave it at that. Um, but it lists the available services that it's going to allow you to fake, and then it allows you to select each one of them individually. So you can configure which ones you do want to use, which ones you don't want to use. Um, so a large number of these services are ones that are really common on Unix machines, 
And then there's other ones that are really, really helpful like this one. So HTTPS, um, being able to actually uh, interact with that data is very useful because um, you can't capture that data and then attempt to decrypt it. So if you capture a stream of HTTPS or any SSL data, uh, generally speaking, even if you have the private key, it, um, it ends up being nearly impossible to decrypt the data that you have in the stream. So one of the nice features, in addition to just providing a simulation for the, these different servers, uh, one of the nice features that iNetSim also provides is it provides you visibility into that traffic as well without having to do too much, um, without having to do any kind of decryption. So, but you can see it hits the big ones, FTP, SMTP, POP3, uh, HTTP, HTTPS. It also pretends to be a DNS server, so you don't also have to host and configure your own DNS server. So, so that's enough of uh, looking at the configuration. Well, I'll show you one more thing. So the other thing that allows you to do, um, allows you to set the bind address, um, allows you to change the user it runs as. So actually I'm going to So that it can write in here. It allows you to change the language used in the reports, um, control whether reports are collected or not. Um, and I think the reports. Yeah, so the reports are actually going to be list, uh, collected in there. So. see something that one of the tests I was doing earlier ended up uh, displaying. Um, the other thing too uh, that comes in to be very helpful is that I can actually change the port that it uses for a lot of these services. So, you know, so like HTTP, I can actually change the port number it's going to host the HTTP server on and stuff like that. I can make it pretend to be a different uh, web server as well if I want. Um, the other thing that's nice is that it gives you the ability so that when somebody asks for a certain file type from a web page, it attempts to deliver a file that um, uh, matches that uh, type that's being asked for. So if it tries to download um, like a.exe or something like that, um, <clears throat> this actually tells it what file on the system. So these are right here. Um, oh, where do I have it? Yeah, fake files. So there's data, HTTP fake files. So you can add very easily your own kind of fake files and you can overwrite them with your own data as well. So, um, so that's, uh, that's running as well. So what we have is we have a way for this malware, for whatever we're gonna do, um, to basically try and convince it that it's connecting to a, uh, to a malicious server. So you have that. Um, the other things that we want to do is we want to have more monitoring of what it actually does on the system itself. Um, so um, that's actually achievable with, uh, we actually have a number of different tools for that. So I actually stuck everything into this analysis folder. Um, we have a number of different tools for that. One of them is um, this sysinternal suite. I don't know. I guess that's not too uh, too terrible to view. Um, the sys internal suite is actually a tool that's available.
here. There we go. So it's basically a collection of all of these tools, um, some of which are tools that you may find very useful, like this one on a Unix system that just don't normally come with Windows. Um, others, like S-Delete is a secure, uh, I, I believe it's secure delete, so um, secure delete overwrites the file with like whatever bytes uh, that you tell it to before it finally removes it so that all the data on the drive gets wiped. It's very useful if you, when you delete something, if you really want any record of it to be gone. Um, has move files, you can, I can't, um, pending moves, so um, Microsoft, this is actually a feature you'll find some malware use, is um, uh, Microsoft actually has a feature built into Windows that allows you to schedule a, um, a move of a file uh, on like reboot or something like that. And so uh, if you, for instance, want to move a program that's currently open or a DLL that's currently used by other programs, uh, you can actually use this tool um, to set it up so that that DLL will be scheduled for move to a new place uh, when the computer reboots. Um, it allows you to look, for instance, I had mentioned that uh, system pipe names were um, possibly something that could be uh, used to indicate malware, or that some malware might actually use it. Uh, it gives you a tool to be able to dump a list of those. It also gives you a tool to be able to convert between hexamal and decimal. Um, let's see what else is in here. Gives you a tool, this one's useful. So if you remember, I was demonstrating a um, technique of putting a change in the registry that would cause Notepad to boot up every time my Windows system uh, came up to a new desktop. So on my Windows 7 VM, uh, it always starts up Notepad because I put that in there. Um, that's actually a really common uh, habit or common approach for uh, malware to use. Uh, so they actually made this tool called Auto Runs for Windows, uh, which is part of this suite as well that allows you to go and inspect all of those special uh, system uh, configuration and file paths uh, that can be used for starting programs up. So that's in here. Um, there's also a, um, a Process Explorer tool, which I find very useful. So you might be familiar with, with this, right? So this task manager. So task manager, I'll just do this again. So task manager has like a very limited view into what's going on in your system. Uh, I can actually run, where is it? Process Explorer right here. And I can get like this view, but I can get a whole bunch of more features with it. So for instance, I can see the entire process tree. So I can see that this was opened by this, and that was opened by that, and that was opened by this, and this is opened by this, and this is opened by this. So I can get the whole hierarchy of processes as well, which isn't something that you will typically be able to get. Um, with most of your Windows inspection. So this tool ends up being extremely useful for us as well. Uh, the other nice benefit to this tool, and I'll go and just kind of show you it right now, is that um, if I select any one of these, um, I can actually go and look at properties. So this particular process, I can go and read all sorts of information about what it's doing. Um, you know, how much of the system resources have actually been used by this particular process. Uh, what its performance graph is. So just like Task Manager has the performance graph uh, for the whole system, this one actually allows you to see it on a per-process basis. So um, it allows you to go and inspect the strings data. So remember the strings listing that we were able to see when we were analyzing malware? And this actually has that built in um, for the <coughs> program and also for its memory. So if I want to, I can also look at the strings dump for the process's memory. So the original file, 
or the memory. Um, I can look at the environment, um, the security settings for it, you know, what all network communication it's doing, stuff like that. So, so this ends up being a very useful tool. Um, the only limitation of this tool, a program like this, is that a tool like this doesn't support, um, it, it only supports snapshotting. So I get to see what the state of my system is at any given time, but I don't really get to see what actions are taken on the system over time. There's actually a number of other tools that are useful for that. Um, so one of them, and I'm going to jump back out here, is called um, it's called the process monitor. <clears throat> and let me see. I don't know if I can. No, I can't see it very well. Process monitor actually allows you to um, allows you to log the sequence of steps that occur on the system. Uh, at least the process, uh, so the system API calls that are made, or a certain set of them anyways. Um, there's also another tool that I've found that I enjoy a lot. Um, it's actually a really old tool. Um, uh, so there's not a huge amount of official documentation. There's a lot of people who've continued using it. Uh, technically, it's not maintained by the uh, at least I don't think it's maintained by the um, original developer anymore. Um, I can double check that. But, yeah. but it's available here. And what it allows you to do is uh, it allows you to capture a log of um, <coughs> network activity as well as um, Windows API calls. Uh, the other great feature that it has that a lot of the other things don't is it gives you the ability to capture any deleted or modified files. So when a, um, uh, when a file system modification is made, so when a file is written to disk or something like that, uh, it'll actually, uh, or especially when a file is deleted, it will actually make a copy of that when it's deleted and then store that copy. Uh, in a folder, so you basically get to capture anything. So if a piece of malware downloads a file, runs it, then deletes it really quickly, that type of thing, it allows you to save those uh, save those things. So, and then as you can see, this has been uh, doing stuff in the background uh, for a while. So um, what I'm going to do now uh, is I'm actually going to start up the uh, inetsim. So what you can do is you can see that it uh, shows that it's listening on this port. I should actually just double check. Yeah, or not this port, this IP address. It's listening on this IP address. Uh, what I did in Windows, uh, and I will go over to network, and then to network connections. This is where you have to go. Um, what I ended up doing here um, there's also a way to get it to set up so that it works automatically, so it automatically assigns the right IP addresses in VirtualBox. Uh, I have found, just from my experiences, that it's a lot more reliable and a lot easier to deal with um, if you uh, make those changes so that they're static. So I actually went into the network connection um, settings that's right here and filled in all these things so that the network interface that this is using, so this one, um, that network interface is sitting on the same network range as the one that I just ran ifconfig on, which is back here. So as you can see, they're both on the same network. <coughs> the other thing that I set up was that the default gateway, so this one down here, is configured to be my laptop, so my laptop's VBox network address. Um, and the other thing that I finally did was I set the default DNS server to be that as well, um, because 
inetsim runs a DNS server right here. And because it runs that DNS server, it actually will um, respond any time your client tries to look up a domain name, any domain name, it'll respond and point that at the inetsim. So basically you'll fake any website. So if I really want to, I can go here. So see, and a whole bunch of network traffic was captured when I brought up Internet Explorer. And even though it was trying to go to Bing.com, I got routed to my INET SIM fake network. And so, for instance, I can do, right? And that's what it'll give you if you try and look up any image. So, or I can do test.exe even. And it'll download an exe that's been pre-compiled. Um, so, um, a really common thing that I've seen has been um, a lot of times malware uh, may reach out to a site and um, they want to uh, download a exe file but they randomly choose the name of it. Um, but the site that they download it from is configured to always deliver say the second stage backdoor or something, the new backdoor uh, anytime an exe is downloaded. So what I'll do is I'll try and get that and then I'll post it as one of the sample files in INET SIM so that then when I run my malware in the sandbox the malware will download something that is what it was expecting to download. Um, so I don't know there was like a couple others as well like there was a txt file so here's what the txt file looks like uh, so as you can see he goes and fakes a whole bunch of things um, you actually get like a large number of varying choices with this. I don't know if it has, oh there you go, it has GIF as well. So it's enough fun playing with that. Um, we've also established now, which is always very important, we've established now that my computer is able to communicate or talk to the, um, the fake connection. So um, I found that's a, always an important thing to test before you're trying to run uh, malware samples in there. Uh, so then, I've got that running. The next thing I want to do is I actually want to um, use CaptureBat to start the capture. So what I'm going to do, CaptureBat is not a GUI tool, it's a command line tool. Uh, so I'm actually going to, uh, to run it here. And I, <coughs> I created a folder, uh, what I have found though, is that uh, no matter what I do, CaptureBat always wants to write all the uh, stuff that it's working on, the stuff that it's saving in here. So um, that's what I'm going to end up uh, doing as well. And I think, yeah, I don't think there's any. Okay, cool. can also look up notepad. So it's also important to note that, um, I'm going to go back out here, that for CaptureBat, which is right here, when I download it from the HoneyNet uh, project, um, and there's a reason why it's hosted by the HoneyNet project, it's, pro it's part of one of the tools that they actually use to build their larger like HoneyNet um, suite. Um, it's actually a setup tool, so you actually have to you run it, install it, just like any normal program, and it actually installs some um, kernel level hooks. So it, it installs some supervisor software into your system that'll allow it to do what it wants to do from a monitoring standpoint. So I can do uh, capture bat, and then, or whoops, yeah, like that. So it gives you the ability to log the activity of a file, also copies um, files into the log directory when they are modified or deleted. So there's a logs directory here. So, so as you can see,
see does that. So I'm going to um, so oh. um, I think I need to do So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to run CaptureBat, um, and I'm going to give it the dash H again to show you what I'm going to run. Um, I'm going to have it copy the files into the log directory when they are modified or deleted, and then I'm also going to copy all incoming and outgoing network packets um, from the network adapters in the system. So I'm going to have it <coughs> monitor network traffic and save that into a uh, PCAP, uh, which means that I don't necessarily have to do that with a Wireshark if I don't want to. So this has built-in kind of Wireshark-like functionality. Um, and then I can optionally log a file to disk. What I'm going to do this time, though, is I'm just going to run it um, on the terminal or on the console right here uh, so you can watch it working. So then... And you can see that what it's doing right now is it's saving records of changes that are being made. Uh, so dump cap.exe <coughs> is actually writing data to this file. So it's actually trying to copy uh, packets that I'm, uh, that I'm working on. So I'm going to go and grab this file. What I always like to do with any of these is I like to copy them to the local system first. So what I did was I actually, uh, this is living in a shared folder. So I set up a shared folder that um, allows me to copy stuff between my host and my guest computer. Um, you can see this has been sitting here just tracing all the data that I've been, or I should say all the activity I've been doing um, including when explorer.exe was making changes to show like where a particular um, position of a particular like icon was or something. Um, also captures like process execution, process termination, stuff like that. So I'm going to refresh this and then I'm going to actually stop the capture. So I haven't run the malware yet, but I kind of wanted to give a good example of what was going on here. Uh, so, so you can see that the uh, packet capture was saved in here. So the packet capture was saved in the logs file. Um, then this deleted files folder was also created. Um, deleted files folder has a C, documents and settings, IE user, so it attempts to recreate the entire path structure um, so that it can keep up with any files that are deleted. And then what you can see here is that for some reason, I don't know why, but uh, if you noticed on the process execution, Acrobat Reader did something in the background, like it came up and tried to um, maybe uh, do Acrobat update or something. But it also stored some temp files on disk while it was doing that, and then it deleted them when it no longer needed them. So in reference to our Tuesday discussion about programs writing stuff in the temporary directory, this is an example of a program behaving good, behaving well. Uh, you can also see that Wireshark's uh, temporary data storing all the packet capture that I was doing, that got deleted too, and that got deleted because I clicked this button to stop packet capture, throw it away, and then start it up again. So, um, let's see. Next.
next thing I'm going to do also is I'm just going to load up Acrobat Reader. Um, it does this thing, which I do not want it to do. I don't know what that is, and I do not care. Um, one thing I was going to do, I'm just going to go in here and have, what is this? Okay. So one thing you'll see that's going on here, um, and this is what I dropped in the settings for, is that um, Acrobat is noisy. Acrobat always wants to go and check for updates, just like every other Windows program. Uh, I actually just want to turn that off because I, it's annoying. Um, let's see if I can remember where that was. I totally had it. Uh, if I can't find it, then I will just not worry about it. This. Oh, I can't remember how to. I can't remember where that's stored on this version. But anyway, you can actually turn off the um, Adobe updates if you want. Um, it's not down there. Um, what we'll just have to deal with is that they'll be um, periodically popping up. Um, so let me close this, uh, and then so we have this running. And I can take like a glance. What I like to do is I like to kind of stick this over to the side. Um, and again, this is when I'm doing like live analysis. And the reason for that is that um, I'm going to go to the desktop which is right here, and I'm actually going to open. Whoops. I don't think it's. No, it hasn't executed yet. So. I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to rerun CaptureBat. And this time, I'm going to save uh, the log of all the activity with dash "-l". So dash "-l", I can do like my log file.txt, right? Um, so rather than dumping it on the screen like it was doing before, I can actually have it save all that same data. Whoops. I can have that it save all that same data um, to disk, which is arguably a much easier place for it. Uh, so then, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this. And so this is the suspect PDF that maybe it was sent over to me. And what you noticed there was that Acrobat Reader popped up once and then crashed. Uh, it wasn't really clear that it crashed on the screen. Um, but when it crashed, that was the exploit taking over, and the exploit ended up running a program. Uh, that caused some network traffic to occur. And we can actually look at that. Uh, so what it did <coughs> was it looked up this domain here. So it did a DNS lookup for game.operaa.net. So um, possibly just hoping that, um, say, somebody staring at a uh, network log or network traffic logs or something like that might overlook it. Um, and then our um, INET sim actually responded and told it it can find that host at this IP address, which is ours, not the one there. So then what it did um, is it connected using TCP um, to uh, TCP port 53 on our system for some reason. So it start initiated a connection to that. And that's what these are. So this is initiates and this is the uh, response and then this is the acknowledgement and then this is it trying to send some sort of data. So I don't exactly know what data it's trying to send. Um, but that data is here. Um, And we can see, let me see where it have here. So if I go here, it actually tells me that there is one byte. So it sent this one byte right here. And then, or let's see, where am I? I'm right here, right? Yeah. 
So this one, yeah. So nothing. This one sent one byte, and then the response back was nothing because there was a no response. What it ends up doing is, um, I guess it's waiting for it to get some sort of expected data value back from the system. Um, and if it doesn't get it back in a reasonable amount of time, what ends up happening is what you just saw. So the reason it jumped around was because suddenly um, it, uh, so I can actually, one of the helpful things with uh, Wireshark as well is that I can filter it down to just TCP data so I can see what's going on without having all the other noise in there. So what ended up happening was after it timed out, my INET SIM service actually sent it a uh, shutdown, so sent it a fin uh, which shuts down the connection and this thing responded by shutting down the connection. Um, I acknowledged a shutdown and then the malware immediately initiated a brand new connection. So about one second later or so. Um, so and then here's the SIN hack and then attempts to basically do the same thing over again. Here's that byte zero 01, which I don't know what it means. So so then after I feel like I've let it run enough, I've messed with it enough, then what I can do is I control C to stop um, capture bat. And I can go and see what it has here. So first of all, you can see that it has the my log file dot text, but then also it has some stuff in logs. So if I go into logs, I actually have. Uh, let's see if the deleted files is. Yeah. So <clears throat> I will warn you that this ends up being a. Um, ends up being a combination of multiple runs. The way CaptureBat's designed is that um, I may have a handful of different files and I want to run all of them maybe at different times. Uh, so I can start and stop CaptureBat. Uh, it doesn't clean up any of this space whenever it runs. It actually just reuses what's in there so it leaves stuff behind. Um, but what I can do is I can, uh, I can look through here and I'm just going to go through folder by folder, and what I end up seeing is those Acrobat temp files were created, but then something that's interesting, something else interesting also happened, is this arad.exe got written, or I, I should say got written and then deleted for some reason. Uh, so that's interesting, and I have a copy of it here. Um, so what um, I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this stuff right here. So um, let me hope that I can modify this folder. then I'm going to go over here and I'm going to go, oh, that's interesting. So another thing that this malware did, I guess, is that there's a file called A that just showed up. So this is actually in my, um, my root directory. So that wasn't there before. Um, so I'm going to copy that here. And Windows XP kind of behaves oddly. Um, so I'm going to get my log file and I'm going to copy it here. Um, and what I'm basically doing is I'm putting all of these now on my host. And then I'm going to go into the deleted files here. And I'm going to also copy this file out here. So now I have a copy of all three of these things. And um, this simulation is still running. So how about if I also, oops. I don't have 
I don't have the latest uh, um, it might not save it until after I'm done running. That's probably what's going on. So we got a wall. So this one You can see that <coughs> the service logs are here, so it goes and does a lookup and everything like that. And then there's even a debugging log in case uh, you want to do it. But basically, the service log has all the network activity that we were looking at just now. So, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and stop the simulation because uh, I'm done dealing with it for now. And now there's a brand new report file in here as well. So I'm going to And so now, I've also got a copy of that. So I've got all these files um, right next to each other. Uh, one of the interesting things is this arad.exe um, is really small. And then this a.exe is, is really big. It leads me to believe that this arad has some sort of small functionality. Um, and that stuff will be available in my log file. So um, let's see what the, I can load up my log file like this. And what you will see is that it's actually what we call CSV or comma separated value um, file. So um, let's see if this works. If not, I'll have to manually import it. Um, So I, anytime you have a file like that, you can actually load it into something like this. So let me see if I can remember exactly. Um, open, and then I can do source. Interesting. Oh, I know why. There we go. So then, what I can do is I can import it, and I can look at all the data here. Oops. And I can even, oh, sorry, uh, there it is. So, um, also, yeah, so basically you can go through here. Um, I was actually going to, let's do this. Thank you. 
little text. Okay. And the reason I did that was because then we can do that ends up allowing me to, for instance, look at this, right? So I can limit it down. I can mess with my CSV, so I'm not actually changing the data in there, but what I'm doing is I'm allow it's allowing me to filter by different activity that's going on. So I can see, for instance, all the registry changes that were made by loading this into the spreadsheet. Um, this is also a really cool um, a lot of you are probably familiar with any of the CSV parsing tools or delimited data parsing tools um, that are available in Java and available in Python and stuff like that. I know uh, some of you had to use some of those for the uh, examples in the uh, cloud class um, uh, for the data manipulation ones. But uh, anyway, this thing allows you to get some uh, visibility into what all is going on here um, from a... Um, <coughs> Uh, from a changes perspective and how these columns work is and I'm just doing time check here it tells you timestamp which is very helpful for building a timeline it tells you what uh, family of actions the action was and then within that family what the actual action was it tells you what program caused that action to occur and then it tells you what the um, what what operation it did with that action so for instance, these are the registry ones. So what they do, what they're showing you is that it ran a set value key operation. Uh, this, this program did. So these are Acrobat Reader. So it looks to me like Acro Reader and Acro Read 32 Info. Um, so maybe I don't really want those things. So I can actually eliminate the stuff that is complete junk from my perspective, right? Uh, ditto for explorer.exe. I'm running explorer in the background. Maybe I don't want it. I'm just left with uh, a.exe. So I can go back here, for instance, and I can turn on all the other features again. And maybe I can go through here and see. I don't want to see what Wireshark did. I don't want to see what Acrobat Reader did. Um, I just really care about maybe some of these other ones. Uh, let me see what's going on here. I don't know what Acrobat Read Info is, so I'll have that here. But uh, what is this? Okay, Acro Read Info is the thing that did all this random stuff. So um, maybe I'll turn that one on. So, so now I'm left with a short list of <coughs> what a.exe did. On the system. And so it looks like uh, a.exe um, you know, did a number of different, uh, wrote a PDF to disk, and then a.exe made some modifications in here to the personal folders, the mount points for some reason, I'm not sure why, um, some changes to the desktop. Uh, these might just be the result of it uh, doing something. And then it also kicked off Acrobat Reader 32, um, which is what happens when it opens or when it starts this file. Um, it also wrote ared.exe to disk, and then it executed ared.exe. Um, but it doesn't look like we caught anything that ared.exe did. Um, so what I will say uh, this tool does try and do is um, uh, the tool being um, capture bat is it attempts to limit the actions that are monitored and captured to be those which would be um, typically associated with um, malicious activity. Come on. Let me just check and see what else is going on here. Um, so from this, we can actually build like kind of a sequence of events that happened. Um, <clears throat> you know, now 
analyzing a lot of files and everything might be valuable to um, use something a little bit more sophisticated than Microsoft Excel to do that, or in this case, a LibreOffice spreadsheet. But it at least gives you some uh, good ways to be able to do analysis to see what all happened. So we had those two files. <coughs> And then also, where did I, here it is. at this report and this report tells me remember this is this report covers uh, first me messing with the website using Internet Explorer so I was using IE6 to mess with the website um, but then I also was trying to um, run the malware in there and that's what you see here and you can also see that Adobe Acrobat tried to run in the background and update itself too and um, probably got very confused when it was served up this random HTML file instead of what I was expecting to get. Um, you can see I captured that. Um, <clears throat> if uh, I had more interaction with this malware sample, uh, there would probably be, say, sequences of steps like this that were captured. So. Uh, So I can look at the arad.exe to try and see what it does. Interestingly enough, it has like this random string in there. very simple file. I'm not sure what it does and we would probably want to run it by itself. Um, and then also there's a.exe. And a.exe has a whole bunch of these things. So it's interesting is that it also has this PDF in here. So that PDF that it wrote to disk, ared.pdf, -A -A uh, is actually stored uh, verbatim within this file. So it has that, and then it also has um, a copy of this arad.exe. Uh, so what I can also do, um, if I remember correctly, do I have, I can't remember if I have a, don't think I have, don't think I have um, Installed Ida Pro on here. I think it's only. benefits to me copying everything out is that now I can very easily just add another um, shared drive mount point. Those of you who are having trouble um, writing, reading and writing files, 
uh, when you use the VBox shared folder. Uh, if you add this option there, what it does is it makes the owner of all the files in the shared folder actually your user. So then I can, you know, I can create files and I can edit them and stuff like that. So what I was going to do um, was actually here, but if I open it here. So now I can go here, here, and then if I want, I can load this up. See what it does. And there we go. Um, with that, I can go to functions, and I can see that there's a handful of functions defined, and that's not too surprising. It's only like a, a few defined. Um, not too surprising considering how small the file was. The file was only seven kilobytes in length. But you can go in and you can look and see what it does. And it goes through and you can you know, analyze it with IDA Pro. And so that's basically you know, what I'd end up doing. Um, what's really nice is that I selected one of the functions that was being called earlier. Looks like it's also called down here. So there's a function that it calls multiple times for some reason. Um, I can go in there and look at what's going on with that um, and try and analyze it. Uh, we're tight on time, so uh, I'm not going to spend a bunch of time hand analyzing this in front of everyone. Um, but it's a really good example, and so that's kind of, uh, you know, none of my run through of being able to capture activity that occurred on the host, so changes that were made on the host. Um, also, um, network traffic that occurred, trying to simulate network traffic, um, and then also trying to, um, say, capture the files and extract all the uh, pieces of malware that landed on the system. Because what ended up happening was uh, that PDF littered a bunch of um, malware samples in different places. Uh, one really good kind of thing to notice about this is if you recall, um, what was it, this arad.exe, that ended up getting written to disk but then at some point that actually ended up getting deleted from disk. So, because it ended up in the deleted uh, files folder. So it'd be really interesting to see uh, what the purpose of that file was uh, when I go through, um, when I go through this here.